All right. Well, good afternoon or good morning to those of you outside the Eastern time zone and welcome to the webinar. Children aren't just smaller adults, making every bite count when nourishing the younger generation. My name is Beth Stark and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and the director of nutrition outreach with the Northeast Beef Promotion Initiative or NEBPI for short, who is sponsoring today's webinar. If you're wondering who is an NEBPI, we are a small but mighty team housed within the PA Beef Council that works on behalf of beef farmers and ranchers to develop and execute programming through the beef checkoff for healthcare professionals like all of you here, consumers, and retail and food service professionals in the Northeast region that encompasses the states of Maine, South to Virginia. In addition to today's webinar, we have many more um, coming up in the, the remainder of this year, and I'm going to tell you about those in just a moment. So I really want you to encourage you to sign up for the remaining two webinars that include one on May 3rd and one on August uh, 9th, both at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. To wrap up our series, our, on May 3rd, we'll be joined by registered dietitian and Oklahoma beef rancher Sherry Glazier, who I believe is on today's uh, webinar with us and a PA beef producer for a webinar plus virtual farm tour entitled Sustainable Nutrition Meets Sustainable Farming, What Healthcare Professionals Need to Know. To wrap up our three-part series on August 9th, chef and registered dietitians Abby Galman and Julie Lopez will host a webinar slash cooking demo combo entitled Optimal Nutrition at All Ages, Culinary Nutrition for the Early Years and Beyond. Uh, after today's webinar, when you receive our follow-up email, you'll receive both additional information and links to register for both of these upcoming webinars. As for some housekeeping items, we've all done the Zoom virtual webinar thing, but just quick reminders for you all. Today's webinar is being hosted via Zoom webinar, where your camera and microphone are disabled for an optimized viewing experience. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, we ask that you use the Q&A feature, and we're going to hold those Q&A, um, those questions and answers until the end of the webinar when Lauren will address them all. We are recording this webinar, and as noted, you will receive a follow-up email from me directly later today that will include a link to today's recording, a survey link, and the CEU certificate, as well as those registered registration links for the May and August webinars. And you'll also be receiving the link, uh, the survey link here within our, uh, our chat in a, a brief little bit of time. And we want you to complete the survey for a chance to win a $35 or more than $35 value uh, beef culinary swag pack. So please make sure to complete that survey about today's webinar. And so now let's get into the main event. I am so pleased to introduce today's fabulous presenter, Lauren Manneker. Lauren is an award-winning registered dietitian, book author, speaker, and nutrition entrepreneur. She's been practicing dietetics since 2004 and has worked in a wide variety of settings over her career. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Florida, a master's degree in clinical nutrition from Rush University, and completed her dietetic internship through the Rush University Medical Center in Medical System in Chicago. She also also earned a certificate in lactation education from the University of California in San Diego. If you recognize Lauren's name, it's because she's been featured in a wide variety of media outlets, including CNN, U.S. News and World Report, Shape and Self. She's also a regular contributor to Eating Well and Very Well Health, to name a few. She currently serves as a member of the Medical Review Board for Eat This, Not That. So welcome, Lauren, and let's take it away. Thank you so much, Beth. I am so happy to be here and thank you for having me. I'm here today to remind everyone and go over the recent guidelines highlighting how children aren't just smaller adults, making every bite count when nourishing the younger generation. So Beth so graciously reviewed my bio. One little tidbit that was not included is that I am also a mother to a seven-year-old. So this information is helpful in my practice as well as personally. Um, it's interesting to see what the experts say and what's actually practical in real life. So I'm gonna try and give um, viewpoints from both sides of things. My daughter is certainly not a picture perfect. <laughs> eat her. She doesn't fall into the what you would expect as a dietitian's daughter. Um, some disclosures before we get going. Of course, this is sponsored by NCBA. With that being said, their sponsorship has not impacted my messaging or um, anything or my viewpoints. I have been working with other commodity boards and brands as well, and they are all listed right here. 
So our learning objectives. Big picture, we're going to be reviewing what the 2020-2025 dietary guidelines suggest that we follow for people aged zero to 18 years of age. We are going to understand the updated guidelines. We're gonna be aware of nutrients of concern for each pediatric age group and how to help families and patients avoid potential nutrition gaps. We're also going to understand how to introduce complementary foods to infants utilizing the most recent nutrition guidelines, which is a pain point for a lot of families because they are just so confused with no thanks to lovely social media and everyone giving their two cents. So before we get going, I thought it would be fun to go through a little history of what we have been doing for feeding children, especially infants and where we are now, which really shows how far we've come and really how far we have to go. This highlights how our ideas change. We work on the information that we have at the time. So back in the 1900s, solid foods were seldom offered before one year of age. And then in around 1920, babies were fed meat and liver during the first two weeks of life, followed by cereal, which is really hard for me to envision, but that's what they did. This was really interesting that in 1930, the concept that children aren't just smaller adults was adopted. So they realized that children and infants are rapidly growing. They're going through so many changes, hormonally, otherwise, they're bones are growing, their brains are developing. They don't just need fewer calories. <laughs> there, there are some unique needs that infants and children need that adults kind of grow out of later in life. Um, I read one article in JAMA that was published in 1942, suggesting that at birth, babies were fed cod liver oil and orange juice. And then in 1959, there were a lot of potatoes going on. Six months, they were given baked and mashed potatoes. At nine months, they were given more potatoes mixed with some meats and veggies. So good for the potato industry back in 1960, right? Um, now, moving on, I guess moving backwards a little bit, in 1954, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Nutrition was formed, their first order of business was to make dietary suggestions based on babies' developmental readiness versus their age. So if you look at two six-month-old babies, one baby can be sitting with little support, they have good head and neck control, they're interested in food, whereas the other six-month-old who could have been born on the exact same day is not showing the same signs of developmental readiness to eat or be fed complementary foods. So we're being told at this point to go by developmental readiness instead of age, which continues to today. Um, and then of course we have made a 180 when it comes to how we handle potentially allergenic foods. In 2000, I found an article from the American Academy of Pediatrics American Academy of Pediatrics detailing that um, solid food should not be introduced into the diet of high-risk infants until six months of age, with dairy products delayed until one year, eggs until you, two years, and peanuts, nuts, and fish until three years of age. And I actually have a picture of myself as a baby being fed scrambled egg whites because my mom was avoiding egg yolks because that's what she was told to do. So I didn't have egg yolks until I was two years old. Um, when this went into effect and babies were being um, being told, the, the caregivers were being told to delay introduction, um, allergy rates actually increased in other areas of the world where um, these foods were not delayed, the allergy rates were not as high come to find that actually exposing babies to these proteins earlier in life can offer some protection. So in 2019, a statement was made again by the AAP that no evidence that delayed introduction to allergens is of benefit and specific guidelines for high-risk infants are available as well. We'll get into a little more detail about that, but that could be a whole other lecture on itself. So 
moral of the story is we're kind of following guidelines or recommendations, not always from expert panels. Some are just one article that we jump off of because it's really all we have at that point. We don't know if it's really been evaluated. Um, and that's where the beauty of the dietary guidelines for Americans comes into play. Believe it or not, they were first developed and published in 1980, so really not that long ago. I like to say not that long ago because I was born in 1980, so when I say not that long ago, that makes me not feel so old. Um, and they're updated every five years. And these guidelines are really based on data. And we all know data is always changing. We always have new information, and because of that, the dietary guidelines are changing which can be frustrating to the public where, you know, eat eggs, don't eat eggs. We don't really know what to do, but it's, it's based on the knowledge that we have at this moment. Um, the goal is to, to provide advice on what to eat and drink to build a healthy diet that can promote healthy growth and development, help prevent diet related chronic disease and meet the nutrient needs. Um, so it's based on the current body of nutrition science. There's a whole committee that evaluates, they discuss, it's, it's a whole to do. Um, we we had these guidelines for 43 years, 42 years, but um, up until 2020, we didn't have guidance for infants, um, our children up to two years of age, or people who are pregnant or who are lactating. So this is exciting news for us because we actually have information that has been vetted and we know it's good information and it's not just based off of like, one article we read or what one person told us on an Instagram post. We have really good information to guide us on what we could tell our clientele. Um, so according to the guidelines, they list some ways that healthy eating can help promote health and reduce the risk of chronic disease based on the data. So from birth to 23 months, they claim that nutrition can help lower the risk of overweight and obesity, lower the risk of type one diabetes, um, provide adequate iron store status and lower the risk of iron deficiency, lower the risk of peanut allergy and lower the risk of asthma. And for children and adolescents, it can lower adiposity and lower total and LDL cholesterol. Um, this isn't included in the dietary guidelines, but there is decent data also showing that nutrition for children and adolescents can impact their bone health for the rest of their lives. It may impact um, their cognition, their mood. Some data even suggests that nutrition can help sleep. So, you know, preaching to the choir, I know. I don't need to go on and on about this one. I think we're all sold on the fact that nutrition can play an important role in people's health. So let's dig in birth to 23 months. So our little babies, we finally are have specific guidance on what we should be telling people to do for their infants. So first and foremost, the recommendation is to feed infants human milk for the first six months, if possible. The guidelines do acknowledge that not everybody is going to feed their babies human milk. Um, the two options for that approach is to either feed them iron fortified infant formula that is regulated by the FDA. So no homemade formula, no formula that was made in someone's home. Um, it can be very, very risky. Um, there was a situation that I saw last year where the FDA went after this man in Michigan who was making his own natural infant formula out of his home and selling it on Instagram because he wasn't adding vitamin D. And he couldn't understand why it was such a big deal because it had everything but vitamin D. Like that's, it's a big deal to not feed infants enough vitamin D, especially because they need to be provided with that nutrient. So homemade is not always better. Um, there's also an option to use donor human milk and they make it very clear that it should be obtained from a source that has screened its donors and taken appropriate safety precautions. Um, you know, there's a lot of trading on Facebook marketplace, neighbors, people that have extra breast milk that want to do the right thing. I don't think people do things like this in a malicious way, but people also don't know what they don't know. And they don't realize that certain medications can be passed 
through breast milk. They don't realize that we're not sure if HIV can be transmitted through breast milk. We don't know how cool they were keeping their freezer or their refrigerator, or if they were doing proper sanitary steps. So they may think they are, but they may not be. So it's really important to highlight to people that if they are not going to be breastfeeding or using their express breast milk, we're, we're still with them and we still want to support them. These are our two other options. We're not just saying, well, you're not breastfeeding and you're on your own, right? We want to still keep these babies safe, well fed. Um, if they are breastfeeding, they do need to be provided with enough vitamin D. Typically, vitamin D is not provided in adequate amounts in breast milk. So they can either be um, provided with vitamin D drops, very easy to grab at a grocery store or a drugstore, or um, the guidelines don't cover this, but um, some decent data is showing that if the lactating person takes um, 6,400 international units of vitamin D, supplemental vitamin D every day, their breast milk tends to trans for enough vitamin D to their infant. So we have two choices. We can take that high dose vitamin D or we can give baby the supplement, but not both at the same time. We don't wanna overdo it. Um, the AAP in 2022 updated their recommendations to um, suggest that um, breastfeeding should be continued exclusive breastfeeding for six months and the complementary foods. And um, the newer part is that they now support continued breastfeeding along with appropriate complementary foods as long as mutually desired by the mother and child for two years or beyond. Um, so now baby is showing interest, baby showing all of those cues that they are developmentally ready to start eating some complementary foods. So they're still getting their formula or the breast milk. And now we are complementing the breast milk or the formula to provide baby with all of the nutrients that they need. So before we used to say food before one is just for fun. It's really not the case. At six months of age, baby needs to be provided with certain foods to help fill those potential nutrition gaps. So the complementary foods ensure adequate nutrition plus exposure to flavors, textures, and different types of food. Um, it can also make for a really cute picture when they have all that food on their face, which you know, isn't really a nutrition thing, but it is super cute. Um, Introducing complementary foods before age four months or waiting until after six months is not recommended. Um, the guidelines do highlight that around a third of all babies in America are fed some sort of food or drink before four months of age. And there are some potential consequences to doing that. Um, I know I got some pressure from the grandmas to feed my baby um, oatmeal before four months of age to help her sleep through the night, which is an old wives tale. Some think it's fun to give them a little bit of ice cream just to see their face. It's really, really so badly not recommended to do that. We want to wait until at the very least four months of age, um, typically around six months when they're really showing those de developmental signs of readiness. We want to provide age and developmentally appropriate foods to help prevent choking. So we're not giving them sliced hot dogs or grapes. That's like the perfect diameter to get lodged in their throat. Um, for infants fed human milk, it is particularly important to include complementary foods that are rich in iron and zinc. Now, those are the two nutrients that are called out in the dietary guidelines for very, very important reasons. So first, let's start with iron. Why is iron a concern? So iron is important to help transport oxygen throughout the body. When babies are born, they're born with iron stores that they're using. They're using it up as they're like living, right? <laughs> they need oxygen being transported and they're using up their iron stores. Breast milk is relatively low in iron and the iron levels are not impacted by the lactating person's diet. So she can eat 
five steaks a week and three triple cheeseburgers, it's not going to make her, um, the levels of iron in the breast milk go that much higher or higher at all. So babies live in life using up the iron stores and then um, around six months of age, baby needs to be provided with external sources of iron to meet their needs. So how do we do that? We choose complementary foods that contain iron, which goes back to the emphasis that food before one is not just for fun. It's really serving a purpose here. So in the United States, an estimated 77% of infants fed human milk have inadequate iron intake during the second half of infancy. Now this stat was put out in 2020 when the dietary guidelines were put out I don't know if they're better or worse now. I'm hoping they're a little better, but 77 is a lot. Um, Iron-rich foods are an important component to the infant's diet from age six through 11 to maintain adequate iron stores, which supports neurologic development and immune function. So iron foods, I, I'm assuming a lot of us know which foods have iron. Um, a lot of the green leafies have iron, a lot of our meats have iron, eggs have iron, shellfish has iron. One thing that is very nice for families to understand is that there is a difference between sources of iron. So we have heme iron and we have non-heme iron. The heme iron comes typically from animal sources. So lean beef, eggs, dark meat, chicken, things like that. Um, the non-heme iron is what you find in the um, non-animal sources. So spinach is a very popular one because it's very easily added to baby food and it's very accessible. Um, data shows that um, 15 to 35% of heme iron is absorbed versus when you're looking at the non-heme iron, two to 20% is absorbed. So if you're eating lean beef versus spinach, you're going to, the baby's going to actually absorb more of that iron from the beef than the spinach, which is not to say don't eat spinach. Spinach is great. It does have iron, it has so many other nutrients in there. But when we're really trying to get the biggest bang for our buck and have the biggest impact because baby's not eating that much, you know, they don't have a huge stomach there. We have to really maximize what we're putting in their bodies. If um, that baby is coming from a family that is okay with them eating animal products, um, those heme sources may be best to be emphasized when it comes to iron. So how are we introducing heme iron sources to babies? Um, between six to eight months of age, you could do pureed protein sources like lean beef with a little breast milk or formula to develop a thin, um, consistent taste and texture. You could combine new foods with the baby's favorites. So if your baby loves prunes, you could do like a beef prune combo over there. And then by eight to 12 months, may, baby may be ready for some new textures, but the food does still need to be soft. So we're not giving them a ribeye and telling them to go to town. Like we really do need to make sure that the beef is soft. Um, and then parents don't have to make a whole production out of it. You could see on this image here, you're double dipping. The parents have their meal, the baby has their meal, you're using the same beef, you're just serving it in a different way. Um, this is a real life example. This is my little niece who is dining al fresco in New Jersey. I did get permission from my sister to share this picture. She is um, munching on some beef. She follows more of the baby led weaning side of things. So um, her parents are both there and she is showing the developmental readiness and her parents gave her a piece of beef to a softer piece of beef for her to not on and she's kind of just chewing on it and sucking on it and getting those juices out of there, getting the flavor, getting some of the nutrients in there. So that's perfectly appropriate as well. If you are of the baby led weaning crowd, typically they say I'm modeling my beautifully unmanicured fingers here. When you are feeding babies uh, beef, 
you want to make strips that are about the width of two fingers put together. I have abnormally thin fingers, so you can go a little thicker than that, but it's a general rule of thumb over there. I definitely should have gotten a manicure before that one. Um, other ways to get heme iron to babies is um, eggs. I love those little egg muffins. It's easy for babies to eat. Um, a lot of sources of fish are great. Trying to get babies to eat sardines is like fantastic. And when they're younger, they seem to be more open to it. So there are lots of ways that you can introduce the um, heme iron to babies. You can also give them the non-heme iron and that will get some iron in their body as well. So spinach is great, beans are great. It's it's still an option. It just isn't giving them that heme iron. Um, so along with the iron, the other nutrient of concern is zinc. So zinc really got its time in the spotlight thanks to COVID. It had so much talk in the press about how it supports our immune health, which is true. Zinc is important when it comes to supporting our immune health. It also supports proper growth and cell division. So it's very important for babies to get enough in their diet. Um, like iron, the lactating person's diet is not going to majorly impact breast milk levels of zinc. Zinc level, breast milk is dynamic, right? So it changes throughout time. It's not always the same in terms of nutrient composition from when baby's born to when baby's six months of age. So when baby's born, zinc levels in breast milk are higher than when baby is around six months of age, which means we have to get the zinc into the baby's belly in some other way. During the second half of infancy, approximately half of US infants fed human milk have inadequate zinc intake. So we want to, along with the iron, prioritize zinc rich foods. The beauty of that is a lot of foods that contain iron also contain zinc. So lean beef, beans, fortified cereal are all sources of both iron and zinc that can help support baby. Um, dairy foods like um, unsweetened yogurt and cheese can also provide some zinc. We don't wanna feed babies under one year of age dairy milk, and we'll get to that also in a little bit. So introducing infants to potentially allergenic foods along with other complementary foods. This is really a big deal that this was included in the dietary guidelines because even though there was some data out there, there was still a lot of confusion. Um, I was finding that a lot of pediatricians were still not 100% clear on really what we should be doing. So having these set out for everyone to follow is just huge because really the allergy rates in the country is scary and not great. So this is very exciting. So they recommend that potentially allergenic foods should be introduced when other complementary foods are introduced to an infant's diet. So they really focus on the top eight, which is peanut, egg, cow's milk products, tree nuts, wheat, crustacean fish, fish and soy, um, they don't talk about sesame, which is number nine, but I'll be curious to see in 2025 if that one's included as well. Um, introducing peanut containing foods in the first year reduces the risk that an infant will develop a food allergy to peanuts, um, specifically for those babies that are not considered to be at risk. Um, there was some really cool data that just came out that showed that when um, the baby was fed peanut protein at six months, it was more protective than when the baby was fed peanut protein at eight months and one year. So delaying it doesn't really benefit baby and in fact may work against baby, if you will. Um, so we really want to expose these babies to these proteins early and often. Cow's milk as a beverage should be introduced at age 12 months or later. So it is appropriate to expose baby to dairy protein, but not from milk, from cheese or unsweetened yogurt. And like I mentioned before, there's no evidence that delaying introduction of allergenic foods beyond when other complementary foods are introduced helps to prevent a food allergy. 
If an infant has severe eczema, an egg allergy, or both, age-appropriate peanut-containing foods should be introduced into the diet as early as four months. I like to recommend that they follow the guidance of their doctor, who hopefully is up to date on what is appropriate for them. Um, some doctors will now allow parents to feed babies the, the peanut foods in the office because they're so worried and rightfully so. So there, there is set guidance. There are a lot more details um, through the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the Quad AI. They really break it down for healthcare providers, for parents, for caregivers. So if that's something you're interested in, I highly suggest you check it out over there. Um, so moving on, we've expose them to their first foods, they're eating the peanut protein, they're eating the shellfish, they're good to go. We're moving on to um, beyond 12 months of age, up to two years. The guidance is pretty general here. We want to eat nutrient-dense, diverse foods, including food sources from each food group. We want to avoid all added sugars at this point. Up until two years of age, the recommendation for added sugar is zero. So really encouraging families to check out the food labels because it is surprising that a lot of the foods that are marketed as baby yogurt or baby whatever has added sugars added to it. In the case of yogurt, there's nothing wrong with taking an unsweetened uh, yogurt, Greek yogurt or full fat yogurt and adding some fruit puree to it if you want to add some extra flavors or textures to it. Um, we want to avoid foods that are higher in sodium. We want to avoid honey and unpasteurized food and beverages. Small amounts of plain fluoridated water can be given with the introduction of complementary foods. Um, up until two years of age, 100% fruit or vegetable juices, sugar sweetened beverages, or caffeine drinks should not be given to infants. So we're eating whole fruits up until two years of age and I love my fruit juice, but we're not doing fruit juice until baby reaches two years of age. So what should we be giving them? Um, a balanced diet that doesn't include the foods that we just covered. So vegetables and fruits, the emphasis should be on those rich in potassium, vitamin A and vitamin C. Protein foods um, are important sources of iron, zinc, protein, choline, long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, beans, peas, and lentils, grains, including fortified infant cereal. And um, we could be introducing um, cow's milk food products, but not the milk. Um, one interesting note is dietary guidelines makes it very clear in multiple spots that if a family is not leaning on dairy foods or dairy milk when baby is um, 12 months or older, the only alternative that they recommend as a comparable solution is soy. So if they are not doing dairy milk, um, they recommend soy milk. They are not recommending almond milk, coconut milk, cricket milk, whatever, all those other milks out there. They typically don't have as much protein. A lot of them have added sugars to it. They don't have um, a lot of the micronutrients that babies require. So that's, that's kind of a hot topic among the um, parent crowd. So just be mindful that that's not in the guidelines. So, toddlers, those lovely toddlers who start having opinions. Um, we want to highlight that diversity is key. We want to keep exposing them to different foods. Um, if they say they don't like it, we want to keep at least giving them the chance, you know, taste buds evolve and change as we go. And even if they're not going to be eating it, vegetables belong on the dinner plate. And it's just the way it is. And seeing other parents or other people that they're enjoying meals with eating these foods sets them up for long-term success. Um, based on the FDA and EPA's joint advice about eating fish, young children should eat seafood lowest in methylmercury, and certain species of seafood should be avoided. So fish isn't always top of mind when it comes to feeding toddlers, but fish is a fantastic source of those important DHA, EPA, omega-3 fatty acids, which they need for their brain health and their eye health. 
So um, opting for the lower mercury choices is important, but it should be a part of their diet. We want to stay away from those larger fish, like um, mine is going blank, shark. I don't know how many of us eat shark these days. Swordfish, marlin, tilefish, king mackerel are the ones that they really shouldn't be eating. But um, those that are lower in mercury, like the sardines, the salmon are all fantastic. And um, the recommendation to limit saturated fat to less than 10% does not apply to those younger than two. Once we reach two years of age, then we start monitoring the saturated fat intake. But at the two years and younger mark, we're just eating and fat is an important part of their um, developmental journey. So children and adult, children and adolescents, where we're maybe having a harder time navigating because they're making their own choices. They have their own lives. They're going to school and they cannot eat what we're giving to them. Um, but there are some concerns in this population. And in my opinion, we are not giving it enough attention. I feel like once babies reach two years old, then we're kind of like, <laughs> good luck to you and moving on. Um, and if you don't know, this lovely picture is my little peanut who is here eating some lean beef, some white rice, some veggies, and some blueberries. She would much rather eat something like a slice of pizza, but we do um, encourage eating all of the food groups in our home. Um, the emphasis the dietary guidelines gives when it comes to this population um, is that suboptimal current intake patterns among children and adolescents and inadequate physical activity are contributing to overweight and obesity in this life stage. Now, while a lot of us are already very, very aware that weight and having obesity is not the end all be all to what your health status is, they do emphasize that increased risk of chronic disease later in life is linked to these measurements. That could be a whole other topic in itself, but this is what the guidelines say. Um, and they really encourage people to try and change that trajectory. Um, calorie needs generally increase throughout the stage, but we don't wanna eat calories just for the sake of eating calories. We also really want to pay attention to which nutrients we're eating or they're eating. So adolescent nutrition, the difference between recommended food groups, amounts, and current intakes is greater for adolescents age 14 through 18 than for any other age group across the lifespan. So this age group is just missing the mark on so many aspects of what is recommended. Adolescents are at a greater risk of dietary inadequacy than our other age groups specifically lower intake of grains, dairy and dairy alternatives, fruits and vegetables um, lead to low intakes of three key nutrients that they call out, phosphorus, magnesium, and choline. So there is a lot of opportunity with adolescent nutrition. Um, unfortunately, adolescent adolescents aren't always going to seek help from a dietitian if there isn't a major concern. Um, they are still seeing their pediatrician. So if you do have any relationship with a pediatrician, this is an important thing to discuss that isn't always discussed and doesn't nearly get as much attention as it should. I mean, they're, they're definitely missing the mark here. Um, adolescent females have even more to focus on because Generally speaking, they consume less meat, poultry, and eggs than adolescent males do. They also have low consumption of seafood and other protein subgroups, including beans, peas, and lentils. They also have underconsumption of total protein and low dietary intakes of iron, folate, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12. And this is especially concerning because adolescence is a time where they're still growing. They're still developing. They are going to be menstruating where they are losing, or they are going to be needing more of certain nutrients, namely iron as they are bleeding. Um, their hormonal changes can affect things as well. So 
let's 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 elevate this conversation here. Um, and iron deficiency in um, this population is a big deal for a lot of reasons. And here's an example of just one study that highlights the importance. The prevalence of iron deficiency among non-pregnant reproductive age US women significantly exceeded the rates among males. And iron deficiency is known to have unrecognized symptoms, including poor school performance, mood, and concentration difficulty. So, you know, a lot of adolescent females have these complaints. Are we really looking at their iron status and trying to stay ahead of it? So, um, bottom line, we want to fuel a healthier generation with nutrition. And thanks to all of us in this field, we can play an important role in making that happen. So some key steps, um, we want to follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. We want to feed infants um, iron-fortified infant formula during the first year of life when human milk is not available. If they're being fed human milk, we want to make sure they're getting enough vitamin D through supplementation, either through the lactating person or through um, supplementation being provided to the baby. Um, we want to remember the core elements that make up a healthy dietary pattern that include vegetables of all types, fruit, especially whole fruit, which can also include frozen fruit or canned fruit, or not just saying fresh fruit, um, grains, at least half of which are whole grains, dairy, including fat-free or low-fat milk, yogurt and cheese, or lactose-free versions, or fortified soy beverages, um, protein foods, including lean beef, peas, lentils, poultry, eggs, seafood, oils, including vegetable oils and oils and foods such as seafood and nuts. Um, we want to limit added sugars. We um, want to pay attention to the saturated fat that children are eating once they reach the age of two. And for sodium, we want it to be less than 2,300 milligrams per day and even less for children under the age of 14. Um, we want to customize and enjoy nutrient-dense food and beverage choices to reflect personal preferences, cultural traditions, and budgetary considerations. Um, definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach, and that's where our expertise comes in. We're not robots. The other, our clientele are not robots, and we're not just handing people a meal plan and sending them on their way. Finding ways to really make this work for them, and that's realistic. You know, not everyone eats pizza. I, don't, I can't think of an example. Not everyone eats the same food. And we have to really appreciate that and understand that and um, honor that. Um, so some resources. Um, Beef is What's for Dinner has some fantastic resources for age-appropriate recipes, some guidance on how to include iron and zinc in those um, diets, especially of the populations that really need it most. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has some fantastic resources, um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics as well. Also, I mentioned the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology that you can lean on for the um, allergy risk reduction steps, and then um, some federal programs like SNAP and WIC um, are also great resources to lean on and partner with to um, help make sure that um, every human from age zero to 18 years old are at least getting the support that they need to try and hit these targets that are set. Um, here are some references too that you can check out at your leisure. And now I thank you for your time and I will open this up to um, Beth who will be facilitating the Q&A part of this. Awesome job, Lauren. This was just so wonderful. We have a lot of great questions that have been like coming in. Um, so thank you to everyone that's uh, asked a question so far and now is the Q&A portion. So please feel free to drop those questions and we will hopefully be able to get to those um, momentarily. We have about 15 minutes left here in the webinar. Also just want to quickly mention that we have we will be placing that webinar survey in the chat box. Again, please complete the survey by midnight tomorrow night, uh, January 27th. And we're hoping um, that we can award um, a 
about three uh, randomly selected individuals with a really great beef swag pack worth about $35. So who doesn't love a giveaway as an incentive? So please complete that survey just to allow us to collect some really important information regarding our webinar today. Um, and without further ado here, I will start to weave through these questions. Um, so our first question, Lauren, um, is beyond connection, what are the benefits of breastfeeding after six months slash 12 months from a health and nutrition perspective? Are they more for the mom or for the baby? Um, it can be for both. Um, I, I'm not 100% familiar with all of the data on that topic. The only aspect that I'm familiar with is the um, immune support. Um, your babies are still getting some immune support from mom's breast milk that's live and is passing those probiotics and prebiotics. Wonderful. Um, and then this this uh, question is to repeat the percent absorption of iron with heme and non-heme iron sources. Yes. So heme is 15 to 35 percent and non-heme is 2 to 20 percent. And I included the resources at the end of the slide and you can also email me and I can send them to you if you don't want to sort through all of those. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, this question asks, do you know what the recommended amount of iron is for infants and how would vegetarian diets reach that amount um, like kind of in a, an easy and an approachable way? Yeah, so I don't know the number off the top of my head on the exact number that they need to target. Um, and vegetarians can certainly reach that number if they're not eating those heme sources. They just may need to eat more. So they mm -hmm. may need to just eat more servings of beans and spinach and just make a bigger um, effort to include those foods. And other things that parents or caregivers can do is combine those non-heme mm -hmm. sources with vitamin C. So um, citrus with your spinach. I keep talking about spinach. There's so many other sources of non-heme that aren't coming to my brain. But um, combining the vitamin C with the non-heme can um, help with that absorption as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when discussing introducing foods for infants, do you use the corrected age for babies that were born prematurely? I do. I use the corrected age. Perfect. Um, who did you say only recommends soy milk as an alternative to cow's milk? She said she missed the organization that was mentioned there. It's in the dietary guidelines. So it's um, the USDA and Health and Human Services. Perfect. And this one, I think you sort of touched on this with your very first question, but it was going back to recommendations for milk after one is like, what is the recommendation for continuing breast milk as the milk option beyond one year? Can you say that again? Sure. Is there like, you know, I know some individuals may carry breast milk into past one year. You know, is there a recommendation like regarding continuing milk past the first year of age? So um, beyond one year of age, if the parent wants to and the child wants to. Um, the AAP is now recognizing that it is appropriate up until um, two years or beyond some families, four years. Um, there, there's really no established time that they need to stop. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. answering the question. So yeah, I think that's a fair way to answer. And it is like such an individualized thing. And at that point too, then you would most likely assume that you're feeding those complementary first foods as well in tandem. So the breast milk isn't the only source of nutrition at that stage. You know, you're adding in and like, you know, experimenting with a lot of other solid foods at that point too. Um, and Janelle, yeah, if we did not answer that question, just please drop uh, an additional question in there and we'll help to clarify that. Um, regarding toddler hydration, how much dairy milk can a toddler drink per day before anemia could be a concern? Typically the recommendation is um, three servings. So um, you wanna do three servings and I, this isn't an official recommendation, but when my daughter was younger, I really made an effort to um, try and space those out. So not giving her milk right before her meal. So she would eat those iron foods and, you know, cause milk can be kind of filling as well. Um, and then some data is showing that um, taking iron and calcium at the same time can compete for absorption in the gut. So not taking mm -hmm. those nutrients at the same time too, but um, long answer long three. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Oh my goodness here. Then we got like all of a sudden I feel like a flood of questions has come in. So I'm trying to like read them quickly to like kind of like understand them, do you want to relay them onto you here, Lauren? Um, so are there benefits to including fiber for infants? Um, they don't specifically say fiber for infants. I mean, you're getting fiber if you're following the guideline of eating um mm -hmm. with a variety of foods, including fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. but they're it's not emphasized as one nutrient of concern as um, the iron and the zinc are. So basically we should continue doing what we're doing in terms of fiber for that age group. Yep. Great point. So yeah, aligning with the dietary guidelines and then that need should be met without, you know, without issue. Um, did you say that um, adolescents have the highest nutritional needs over others? I'm guessing she means over other, the other like age ranges that were discussed here? They're the ones that are, how do I word this? They're missing the mark more than any other age group. So they're not taking in the appropriate amount of nutrients to a larger degree than all other age groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense for sure. Um, one, this is, I think a great, um, a great one. To, it's kind of like a comment plus a question. She said, this is excellent information. One of the biggest issues I see is portion sizes for children, obviously adults as well, but portions given to children are too big for their little tummies and bodies. Uh, individuals, you know, on social media often probably over, you know, serve in that um, in example as well. Any suggestions for discussing and encouraging smaller portion sizes for kind of the younger bellies, I guess, that we're talking yeah, about? I, I think it's really exactly what you're saying, reminding people that their bellies aren't that big. Um, mm -hmm. I, I always had that conversation when I was working with infant feeding and babies were spitting up and the parents mm -hmm. were freaking out and reminding them that the baby's stomach, you know, when they're born, it's like the size of a cherry. So if you're mm -hmm. forcing them to drink an entire bottle, it has to go somewhere. So mm -hmm. reminding them that, you know, babies bellies aren't that small and you want to allow them to have opportunity to eat a few hours later, you know, snacks at that age are basically mini meals and they're not just to give them food. They're it's mm -hmm. to serve a purpose to um, fill in certain nutrition gaps. So, you know, reminding people that like this meal isn't meant to like sustain them for six or seven hours. It's mm -hmm. meant to, you know, fuel their tiny belly and they, they should have another opportunity to eat in a few hours. Mm -hmm. I've also heard too, that when you overserve a child, sometimes they, you know, probably at a later stage that they can become overwhelmed. So that may be a challenge just in getting them to be receptive to different foods, because, you know, you may think that's an adequate portion, but it may just be too large. And it's something that almost like turns them off and it can be hard to introduce new food foods with that same kind of strategy. Um, and speaking of picky eaters, they know um, you mentioned at the top that your daughter is not that kind of like what people think as the dietitian's daughter and what she may eat as far as her palate goes. So any tips for picky eaters? Eaters, which again, that could be a whole presentation in itself. <laughs> it could. And I, I could share what I do. So this isn't in the mm -hmm. dietary guidelines at all, but some things that have helped on our journey, which certainly there are areas for opportunity on our journey. I try to model. So I'm eating the salads and talking about the salad and, you know, dietitian brain. I'm talking about what the salad's doing for me and my body, hoping that motivates her. Um, one thing that's really helped us, she's seven, so she understands a little more, is her now understanding the concept that taste buds can change. So she's mm -hmm. tried foods when she was younger and she says, I don't like them. And I remind her that you didn't like them when you were four, but taste buds change over time. I used to not eat asparagus and now I love asparagus. So. Mm -hmm that makes her not so afraid to try a food that in her mind is not delicious because her taste buds may change. And we've had success with that too. Like she tried a cinnamon raisin bagel the other day that she hated two years ago. So now it's exciting that like we can start over again with everything. Um, the frequent exposure we do, even though it's getting kind of expensive to do because there's sometimes <laughs> wasted food there. Um, but you know, those are things we do. And then we really don't do the good food, bad food. Every plate has something that I know that she'll like low pressure, you know, just try it. If you don't like it, there's no consequence. It's not like you have to eat this and then you'll get your dessert. 
um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just trying to keep it as low, low stress, low pressure as possible. And like keeping my angst inside and not letting her know that it's driving me crazy. Yes. Oh, I think I'm going to definitely use a piece of advice about the, the taste bud change with my own six-year-old. So you've just given me a nugget for my own household. So really, really great information there. Um, and let's see, I'm going to try to get to a couple more questions. We have about four more minutes here. Um, this is a really good one. I just wanted to, I kind of skipped down to, but what is the appropriate timeline for introducing a new allergen food in infants? Um, they're asking if it's every other day, every week, that might well, vary. You know, I, they don't talk about it in the guidelines. They just say to introduce it. Um, this is a little old school, but I still like to do the three day rule, um, like exposing it for three days, seeing if anything happens and then moving on to the next one. Um, the guidelines don't have set guidelines on that. They really didn't get into that much detail on how to approach it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to uh-huh. the- It is recommended to, um, it's two grams three times a week. So that's one specific that um, people can follow. So that's also an important thing to remember is when we talk about exposing babies to peanut protein, um, it's frequent exposure. It's not like Mm -hmm. you give them peanuts once and then again when they're a year old, like we're continuing Mm -hmm. to um, expose them to that peanut protein. Great advice. Um, do I recommend adolescent specific multivitamin supplements if ch- uh, children are extremely pick- picky eaters? Um, you know, it depends. I find that with a lot of picky eaters, they're eating a lot of those fortified foods that have like folic acid and vitamin B12 and a lot of the nutrients that are found in a lot of these multivitamins. So I don't love generic multivitamins for everyone. I really I think supplements certainly have their place, but I like to see which nutrients they're missing and supplement those. Like typically the pickier adolescents are not eating their seafood twice a week. So it may be better to explore a fish oil supplement versus a multivitamin that's giving them vitamin C and folic acid, and they have no problem drinking orange juice and eating fortified cereal, you know? So Mm -hmm. Um, it really depends on the person, but I, I encourage people to really explore which nutrients they have potential gaps in with grammar uh-huh. and um, mm-hmm. supplement that way. I mean, I, I supplement my daughter with certain things and people are surprised. I don't give her a multivitamin and I get multivitamin supplements like coming out of my ears. <laughs> she eats fruit. Like she eats fruit. Mm-hmm. She doesn't need additional vitamin C. Like she's good with the vitamin C. She's not eating her, mm-hmm. she gets a fish oil supplement. She's not great at eating eggs. She gets a choline supplement. Like I'm filling those gaps that I know she has. Got it. Got it. Well, gosh, I feel like personalized nutrition. I feel like that's kind of like, like all the rage and in, in different, you know, areas of specialty. So that like aligns very nicely with that. And, you know, sadly here it's 159 Eastern time already. So we are going to have to wrap up this webinar. I know we did not get to all of those questions, um, but you will be receiving an email directly from me that if you would like to pose that question back to me, I'll make sure that Lauren gets it. And then she'll be able to get that information back to you. Um, again, just want to thank everyone that joined us uh, today. We had a really amazing tur- turnout and Lauren shared such awesome information of how to, you know, optimize that nutrient intake of, you know, these youngsters to, you know, build their, their bodies at this young and very rapid stage of growth and development. Again, please do complete that survey that's coming to you via email after the fact. Um, you will receive your CEU certificate in there as well as the recording and some additional resources and information, plus the additional webinar registration links for our webinar in May and in August. So we hope to see you back for those. Um, and again, I, I, I think that's a wrap. So thank you again, Lauren, uh, for being here today. And thank you all for um, everyone's uh, participation. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming.